Thank you very much. So this is just a quick update on paediatric ACL injuries, uh, investigation and current management. So why do we care? The incidence of paediatric ACL injuries is skyrocketing. Uh, there's more and more competitive sport, particularly in girls and young women with the advent of the WAFL and the Women's Big Bash. There's a lot more girls being streamed into competitive uh, sports teams and re representative groups early on. We know that women have a higher rate of ACL injuries than men for every hour they spend playing sport. And the rate of injuries in kids is going up by somewhere between seven and 9% per year. ACL injuries, if you take everyone, paediatrics and adults, cost Medicare $150 million in 2015 and has gone up to about 200 recently. So it's very costly to the community. So we need to work out which ones of these need treatment and how we're gonna treat them. For paediatric ACL injuries, what we're really concerned about compared to the adults is the remaining growth. The ACL reconstructions we do in adults need to cross the physeal scar. So in paediatrics, if we do that, we'll cause a growth arrest and a limb deformity. In terms of history and examination, the main thing to note with kids is there's no question clinical test or imaging modality that will diagnose an ACL injury every single time. I'll go over the rates of MRI diagnosis and clinical findings later for you, and they're all in the slides as well if you wanna look at them. In terms of history, the key points we want to know is what is the mechanism of injury? You guys all know this. They're non-contact pivoting injuries, classically in kids, same as the adults. But in children, hyperextension injuries of the knee, uh, particularly with their foot on something and a friend or sibling jumping on their knee is a really common cause of pediatric ACL injuries, whereas in the adults, you'd classically get a PCL injury with that. We want to know if they've had an early hemarthrosis within the first hour or two. Has their knee ballooned and swollen up? Could they weight bear afterwards? Did they need assistance? What other injuries have they had to their knee? And we want to know if they've got clicking, catching and locking after the injury because we want to know if they've got associated meniscal pathology or an OCD. Particularly in kids, the important things to note with your assessment are their current age, for girls, what their age of menarche was and try and make an estimate of their peak growth velocity. And the easy questions for that are when was the last time you had to buy a new pair of sports shoes because you grew out of them. And if it's every six months, they're entering their teenage uh, pubertal growth spurt. Moving on to knee examination. What we want to know is their overall alignment. Is it neutral, varus, or valgus? We know valgus knee alignment predisposes to ACL injuries. We want to know when they walk into the office, are they braced or are they needing walking aids such as crutches? Do they have a large effusion hemarthrosis consistent with the injury? Palpation, same as you do for all of your examinations, we're going to feel all of the significant bony and soft tissue structures around the knee, but we particularly want to feel around the anterolateral ligament insertion where you'd see the Sagon fracture on an adult X-ray. And we wanna feel around the MCL and the joint line to make sure there's no injury there. The other thing we wanna know is range of motion. Very, very important for surgery. We don't do ACL reconstructions until the patients have full extension of their knee, or certainly I don't, unless they've got a really significant meniscal pathology or something that needs to be addressed earlier. If we operate on them too early, they'll end up with long-term stiffness and a fleet fixed flexion contracture of their knee, which is really, really difficult to treat, despite them working hard, seeing physios, doing everything diligently. Now with the special test for the knee, I know you all know how to do this, but this is just a bit of a summary of the evidence for them. Now this is for adults. There's very little evidence for paediatrics in terms of uh, the reliability, sensitivity, specificity of the special tests around the knee. So I'll just run through them all for you here. And for kids, kids are lax. All of their knees have more movement than your average adult. They've all got a positive Lockman's test on both of their knees when they come to see you. What we wanna know is, is there a difference between the knees? So first of all, for ACLs, we're gonna start with an anterior draw. It's the easiest test to do. Doesn't matter how big the patient is, doesn't matter how small your hands are, everyone can do it. So with the hip flex to 45, knee flex to 90, we're gonna try and draw the tibia forward and we wanna see a five millimeter difference to the contralateral side. 
as opposed to adults where we're looking for an absolute figure in terms of movement. And for all of these slides, I've just popped down the bottom, the sensitivity and specificity. And you can see this is only 22% sensitive. Okay, so this is not a good test for picking up ACL injuries, but if it is positive, there is a very good chance they do have an ACL injury. And the specificity and sensitivity changes for all of these tests depending on whether the patient is within two weeks of injury or more than two weeks of injury because their pain is settled and allows you to examine them properly. Lockman's test, you all know how to do with the knee bent 20, 30 degrees. What we're looking for is a difference of two millimetres to the contralateral side. The thing with Lockman's test is kids are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and the kids that I see are often weighing 80, 90, or 100 kilos of solid muscle. And if you don't have big enough hands, Lockman's test is really difficult to do consistently and accurately on some of these really large rugby players, particularly the teenage boys. So you've just got to find a way that you can reproduce it. I find the easiest way for these big kids is to bend the knee over the side of the bed or to put my knee underneath their knee to hold it, and then I've got two hands free to manipulate their knee. Much more sensitive, much more specific than the anterior draw. Now the MCL stress test or valgus stress test, the main take home point is do this with the knee at 30 degrees of flexion. This isolates the MCL. If you do it with the knee in full extension, you're stressing the capsule, the ACL, the PCL, and the MCL all at the same time and the chance of you getting a positive finding or an accurate finding are much lower. It's very sensitive and specific for MCL injuries, which is one of the few ones. The Vera stress test, we do for everyone, but the number of people with lateral collateral lig ligament injuries is very low. If you imagine how these injuries occur, MCLs happen when, patient, when people get cleaned up from the outside. It's very hard to get hit on the inside of your knee playing sport because you're protected by your other leg when you're doing it. When you have an associated ACL, when you have an ACL injury, we always look for associated injuries around the posterolateral corner. In kids, these are uncommon, but it's worth having a look. Again, flex to 30 degrees. If you do this in full extension, you're testing the ITB, the biceps, the arcuate complex, and the posterolateral corner, and you're not gonna find any really relevant information. The pivot shift test, you can't do for acute injuries because they're too sore. It is very, very specific if you have a positive pivot shift test. And the main thing you want to know about the test is why it works. So when you're holding the patient's leg for the pivot shift test, what you're doing is you're subluxing the tibia on the lateral side off the femur. When your knee is in extension, your iliotibial band is a knee extensor. When your knee is in flexion, it's a flexor. So what we're doing is we're holding the tibia subluxed, and then as we bend the knee and load it, the IT band will flick over your medial femoral condyle, sorry, over your lateral femoral condyle, and it will reduce the tibia back down under the femur. So that's how we do a pivot shift test. Very, very specific, probably not gonna be positive early on because the patient will be in too much pain. So now in terms of investigations, we've already heard Paul talk about this. Every paediatric knee injury should have an X-ray. If they can't weight bear, they've got an immediate hemarthrosis. There are lots of conditions that mimic ACLs in kids that will only show up on an X-ray or CT scan and it's difficult to pick on an MRI. MRI scans are very useful, but we'll go through the data on them in a minute. And CT scans are only for bony injuries and not for ACL injuries. And I get an EOS scan, which is a standing scanogram from the waist down for anyone who's going to have surgery who's scalarly immature, so we can monitor them from a, for a growth arrest. And just a quick note on the tibial spine avulsion, it's a variant of ACL injuries in kids diagnosed on X-ray or CT. So this is why it's important to get that first before going to an MRI scan. In terms of MRI, Every single child that comes to my clinic has an MRI scan of their knee when they arrive. This is not unreasonable, but a lot of them didn't need it, and a lot of them don't have ACL injuries on the MRI scan that they've had ordered. I would always order an MRI scan if the patient has a locked knee or has significant mechanical symptoms, clicking, catching, locking, associated with their injury. If you're clinically suspicious of an, MRI, of an ACL injury, or a meniscal injury, then an MRI adds value because it will confirm your diagnosis and allow you to plan your surgical management. 
it's beneficial for me to know if the patient has associated meniscal pathology, chondral injuries, before we go into the operating theatre so we can plan the timing of surgery and what we need to order equipment-wise to do the case. It's not required for bony injuries or tibial eminence avulsions, although we do see quite a lot with it. Now, in terms of the management, preventative management for kids is very, very important, and it's becoming more and more popular. You can see here on the slide, this is the FIFA 11 Plus for kids. So the FIFA 11 Plus program is a warm-up program developed for soccer players, and it reduces the rate of ACL injuries by 75%. Okay? So every person who comes to your clinic should get one of these and be handed, just print them out as a handout. That's what I've got in my rooms, and I hand it to them and say, this is now your warm-up for whatever sport you're playing. And the kids' version is specifically done for activities that kids can do, and it's based on their age. So kids are not just small adults. Anyone who's tried to convince their own child to do something knows that. Anyone who's tried to convince an eight-year-old to do physio knows that. They need to be treated differently, and the program is really, really good because it's games that they enjoy doing that will get them to do it. So the, the International Olympic Committee put out a consensus statement in 2018, which was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, which is excellent if anyone wants to read it. You can Google it, it's freely available. And their indications for surgery are a child with a repairable associated injury that requires surgery. So meniscal pathology, OCDs, things like that. Anyone who has recurrent symptomatic knee giving way after completing high quality physiotherapy. Okay. And if the child experiences unacceptable participation restrictions, then we need to go ahead and do it. Now the surgical management is based on the age of the child. And we're going to run through what the options are for each of the age groups. ACL injuries have low rates of return to competitive sport, particularly in children, unless they're already playing at an elite level and have a signed contract for a professional club. There's no long-term studies on OA in children, but in adults we know that children have symptomatic or at least, I mean, sorry, adults have symptomatic or radiographic osteoarthritis within 10 years of an ACL injury if it's not fixed. And there's very high subsequent rates of meniscal injuries in paediatric ACLs, which is about 2% per month. 58% of paediatric patients will present with a meniscal tear. And there's some important factors here. It increases by 12% for every two BMI points above 25, which is a large portion of our patients, and increases by 16% for every year over 10. So older, heavier kids are more likely to have meniscal pathology and therefore more likely to need ACL reconstructions. Now, when you look at this slide, this shows you the MRI sensitivity, specificity, and positive predictive and negative predictive values, okay? And what this slide tells you, you can see highlighted there, it's busy, but an MRI is specific. So if you think someone has an ACL injury and the MRI says they do, chances are they have an ACL injury. But the sensitivity of an MRI for, a, for the pediatric population is only 75%. Okay, so an MRI scan will miss 25% of paediatric ACL injuries. So that's why the clinical examination combined with it is very, very important. Don't just send them off for an MRI scan. Now, in terms of the reconstruction options, for young children, so this is generally under 10 years old, we do non-anatomic ACL reconstruction because we want to spare the physis. We don't want an angular growth deformity around the knee that is very difficult to treat down the line. So for young kids, we do this non-anatomic reconstruction where we take a strip of the IT band, leave it attached distally at Gertie's tubercle, reroute it around the lateral femoral condyle through the knee under the intermeniscal ligament and fix it at the front. Now this works very, very well, and the re-rupture rates from this surgery are actually quite low, despite the fact we haven't reconstructed their ACL. We've just put a strip of the iliotibial band through their knee. Physeal sparing surgery has increased in popularity a lot recently, mostly because our equipment is much better. We can now drill targets under X-ray guidance with very cool surgical toys that allow us to stay right away from the physis, particularly on the femoral side, which is the one that causes the most problems. So boys 10 to 14, as a rough guide, and girls 10 to 12, we can do an, 
a fire seal sparing or all epiphyseal ACL reconstruction. So you can see on the pictures, this doesn't cross the femoral or the tibial physis, although on the tibial side we do anchor the graft distal to the physis. There's a higher re-rupture rate than an anatomic ACL reconstruction, but we have to accept that because if we drill a hole through a 10-year-old's lateral femoral growth plate, they'll end up with an angular limb deformity, and that's unacceptable. Transphyseal reconstructions, we can do on most patients that are within two years of skeletal maturity. It's very similar to the adult ACL reconstruction, but with steeper tunnels, because what we're doing is we're reducing the cross-sectional area of the physis that we've drilled through. We use suspensory fixation rather than a screw, because we don't want anything crossing that physis and causing a bar that's gonna cause the growth arrest. We use hamstrings graft for this, preferably from the patient, uh, but we do have the option of allografts if we need to. The technique points, if you see here, here are your tunnel options. So A is the transphyseal young patient. B is the adult, which you can see would take out a large cross-sectional area of the physis, and C is the all epiphyseal. And what we need to do is minimise growth disturbance and avoid damaging the perichondral ring. Central steep tunnels are best, femur and tibia side, if they can. Surgical risks, growth disturbance, re-injury is somewhere between 18 and 30% in children. Ipsilateral is the same as contralateral, essentially. So that's why these rehab programs are so important. Risk of stiffness and infection, depending on our tunnel placement and the physiotherapy afterwards. Post-op, I've just put this in here for you. It's in the notes, so I won't read it all out. And if you look at the last page of the notes, there's the IOC's uh, return to sport protocol, which is very, very good. It's a detailed return to sport protocol for children, which is assessment at each stage before progressing. It's not time frames. It depends on how the child is doing. Okay, that's available in your notes. Thank you very much.